very much for, for joining the session. Um, uh, it's really a great opportunity for us to be able to uh, explain what we're doing uh, in the Coven project. So the Coven project, as I'm, I'm sure Martin would have been explaining, is a, is a uh, project that's been funded by the UKRI and the Arcadia Fund. Um, it's been running for uh, two and a half years now, and it's uh, designed to uh, um, facilitate infrastructure to support open access book publishing. Uh, in for, so it's a, a community-owned uh, infrastructure for publishing uh, of monographs. Uh, we've got uh, a, a, a several different uh, work packages that are being part of that. Uh, and today we were looking at presenting three of those. Uh, the, the first would, would have been Martin talking about a mechanism about opening the future for how to, how to uh, encourage library support towards uh, funding uh, uh, existing university presses that have um, backlist. Uh, titles. Uh, we've then uh, also developing uh, the um, uh, Open Book uh, um, Collective, which amongst other things will have a platform, uh, and that's what Judith will be talking about, a platform again to, su to, to support and facilitate uh, collective library funding of open access publishing initiatives, but also of infrastructure. Uh, and the third thing that we wanted to talk about today was the development of a metadata database and open dissemination system, uh, which is part of which is part of that as well, uh, which we've called Tote. So what um, uh, what I, I will do uh, is sort of <laughs> in reversing the order of everything. I'll start talking about Tote. We'll, so we'll start at the bottom, if you like, and then we'll talk about um, uh, uh, the Open Book Collective, and then uh, hopefully Martin will. Then Martin's reporting will be there to be able to talk about the uh, opening the future program specifically. Okay, so I've got um, some slides. Can I screen share uh, some slides uh, there? And I think I should be able to start the slides there. And I'm hoping that that is. Is, uh, is coming through okay. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was introduce uh, TOTE, which as I said, is, is a open metadata management and dissemination service for open access books that uh, we've been developing as part of the Copen project. Uh, the the, the, the um, main idea is, uh, th this is just a, a screenshot of the TOTE uh, webpage. You can see the TOTE webpage uh, here if anybody wants to log on and have a look. Uh, and so what we've been developing is, a, is a, a, an open uh, meta database, uh, the protocols and infrastructure to be able to better integrate um, the, the metadata about open access books into the discovery dissemination repository systems. So um, many small publishers, particularly, one of the big difficulties that's, that's faced is getting the metadata and getting the books out to the multiple platforms that are available. And with open access books in particular, the number of platforms that are available is increasing dramatically. Uh, and that's great because then more people can access the book and discover the book and that's, that's, that's great news. So it's to be encouraged, but it's a problem uh, from, from the publisher's side about how to do that. So open book publishers, uh, so I'm a, a co-founder of open book publishers, which is an open access book um, uh, publisher, we disseminate to over 20 different platforms. All of them require metadata in some different form, a standard or other. And so metadata management is a major, a major problem for us. Uh, the, um, uh, so, so what we've, uh, hoping to, what we have done is develop a, a, a metadata database, uh, that we set as sort of, if, if possible, as a form of Rosetta Stone, so that we can bring in uh, metadata, the publishers can input metadata into the database, they can use it as a, as a management system for their metadata, but then we can then generate lots of different formats and standards for the distribution of that, that, that metadata to facilitate the discovery and, dis dis uh, discovery and dissemination of the open access content. 
So, uh, so what I wanted to do was just ex walk through a little bit uh, what the what the structure is, uh, and and then uh, where where uh, where the business model and sustainability of this will be going forward. And so, to start with, we've got the situation that I described, where we've got a bunch of small publishers uh, who are who would be looking to use Tote as a metadata management platform. And so, presently, we have. Uh, about 10 publishers that have inputted metadata. And three of those, that's Open Book Publishers, uh, Punctum, and uh, Media Studies Press, are using this as the primary and, in fact, sole metadata management um, uh, um, facility that we've got within our publishing uh, company. Uh, so, so here, um, it's, it, the, the tote is providing a bunch of of interfaces in which to input and in, in data into the database. Uh, the one that we are using presently is, is a user interface that we've got. And so we're using that as part of the production process, our editors and our book producers, et cetera, are inputting the metadata as it grows. So it's a growing feature. And then on publication, hopefully we've got complete metadata, but we're using it for the entire transition of the title as it goes through or within, within the, the, the tote database. So, that's one use case in itself, is that this is a way of, of, for us to manage our metadata. The second thing is there's two ways of outputting the metadata from, from, from Tote. One is through an API. Uh, and so there's a, there's a, a GraphQL API that's there, uh, openly available. Uh, and, and we use that as a feed for open book um, web, uh, website itself. Uh, so we've got a new website. Again, it's a white label website, so it'll be available for anybody else as well. But it's calling all of the metadata that we get is coming directly and on the fly from, from Tote. And as we'll talk about in a second, uh, with Judith, we'll talk about Open Book Collective. A lot of the metadata that's, going to, that's used for that, that platform for books that are being supported by the or publishers that are being supported by the platform, the metadata drawn from that will also be coming from Tote through the API. That's the open API, so anybody can use that to access metadata. For, um, uh, so that's a, just a quick um, look at the sort of a new uh, uh, website for open book publishers. And you can see all of the metadata there, uh, all the ISBNs, all the DOIs, the, the title, the image, the, 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 the blurb, uh, all of that is being drawn on the fly from the, uh, the, the, the tote database. The second uh, method of dissemination is through the creation of the various types of metadata files and then submission of those metadata files to the various platforms. And so we've, we've, got cre we've created um, multiple outputs, uh, on, and I've got some of them here, here, various flavors of Onyx, CSV, KBART, JSON, BibTeX, uh, XML for cross-ref, um, DRI submissions. So once again, uh, all of the the, um, uh, the various platforms have got different flavors of Onyx or you know, for Crossref, they've got a particular type of, of, of XML submission to make DOI submissions. Uh, and so uh, we can generate all of those, those different types of standards uh, and then distribute them out to the various platforms. And so I've got a, a subset of the platforms that are, that are there. Uh, again, um, all of this, uh, all of the data is open, all the, 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 the database itself is open, it's all available on the wiki, which is uh, on the GitHub, which is uh, uh, on the, the Tote website. Uh, and that includes uh, details of, of, I think we've identified about 120 different distribution outlets. We, we, we haven't hit them all yet, but hopefully we'll be ticking those off to be able to distribute to all of those outlets. Um, over time. Uh, so altogether, we've got a, 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 a sort of an open metadata ecology, if you like, for, uh, for um, open access books, where we can have uh, publishers ingesting data into Tote, uh, Tote then being distributed either through the APIs or through, uh, through the, the various different file formats that are, that are required by the, the various um, distribution platforms. Uh, and so this is this is now all in operation. And so this is the system that Open Book Publishers is using. So this is, if you like, a minimum viable product now. 
This, this is a completely operational system. Open Book Publishers uses it to ingest the data. We use it to create the website that will be coming out very shortly, but our new website is being generated from this and uh, all of our distribution to the 20 odd various channels that we do it, all of that is being done through metadata that's been created from the format that, that, that um, we see here. Uh, we're also, I, I should add, looking to be able to distribute to uh, repositories. And so we're, we've, we've got test cases for the, the ability to uh, use the APIs of DSpace, ePrints, and Figshare to be able to automatically ingest um, both data and content into various library repositories, which will be useful for archiving and preservation purposes. Okay, so um, uh, uh, a brief overview of the, uh, the, the proposed business model going forward. You know, how does it, we've, we've got funding for this uh, through till the end of May next year. So we've got a year's more funding which will allow us to develop a, a, a several more features that we're wanting to do. Um, but clearly it's got to be able to survive after that uh, and be a sustainable ongoing project. So the first thing that I should say is that uh, we're um, intending for this to be a nonprofit subsidiary of the Open Book Collective. And Judith will talk more about that, but the Open Book Collective will itself be a community owned charity. And so the whole idea here is that everything that we're doing is open and community owned. And this will ensure that this is also a community-owned uh, uh, project and, 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 and uh, operation. But it will be a subsidiary. So it will be operating uh, separately and uh, any, uh, one doesn't need to be a member of the Open Book Collective necessarily to be uh, part of and to be a user of, of the TOE database. In fact, it's open, anybody can be. So um, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't restrict that um, anyway. Uh, we can break down the, the various types of um, uh, uh, use cases, if you like, uh, for TOTE. Uh, we can imagine uh, as the, the structure that I've already described, where data is being inputted through an API or, or a user interface or through an Onyx feed directly into, into the database, and then we're getting all of those outputs out there. And that the, 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 the main uh, idea of this is that would that would be a free um, uh, database. It's an open and free database that anybody could use for any of those reasons. Um, but we would be asking um, uh, uh, optionally for for publishers and libraries that that are using it to, to support that through membership program. But it, that would be no requirement for that. That would be an optional membership that they could come through and do. The second thing, though, is that there could well be a, a, a publishers who would like some support uh, in formatting their metadata, ingesting the backlist, in validating or possibly enhancing the metadata, uh, and also in the distribution, curated distribution uh, through to the various channels. And these are services that will take time. Uh, they can't be automated. It needs people at the background. And so for these, we would be looking to charge. And so we'd be seeing this as a service. So tote as a service. So if you like, we've got TOTE as a database, which we're hoping to be free, we're aiming to be free, uh, and TOTE as a service, which would be the paid for component of, of, uh, of the TOTE um, altogether. Uh, and sort of very, very brief indicative uh, funding uh, pricing for that, you know, uh, we, uh, there could be some, some membership packages there for, for publishers or, or, or libraries with some sort of tiered component to that. Uh, and then we also have some sort of um, uh, tiered or per title uh, charges for uh, metadata enhancement or managed content dissemination. Uh, so some brief examples of that. If I was a small publisher with less, uh, let's say, 10 books uh, per annum, then, you know, basic optional membership would be about £150 in that per annum. But if you wanted the sort of... Uh, more all singing, all dancing, then it would be 460 pounds um, uh, and similar type of, of structure for uh, slightly larger um, publishers. So that that is, is tote. Um, uh, we'll be um, bringing that and encourage, we will we'll just really encourage anybody who might be interested in using tote, uh, working with us as we develop out, out, out these services and then as, as we roll it out to, to reach out and make contact with us. Uh, and 
Um, that's pretty close to my 12 minutes. Um, and of course, any questions at the end? Thank you very much. I've got a... Should I take over? Yes, please. Can you take over? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. I will I do. Yep. So my, my presentation also has a video. I think it will work with sound um, because I'm using different inputs and outputs for my speaker and mic. If it doesn't, it's not a disaster because it has subtitles, but we shall see. Share screen. Share. Okay, you are screen sharing. Right. Slide show from the beginning. All right, so I'm just going to move this over so I can see the screen better. Um, in this part of the presentation, I'm going to introduce the Open Book Collective that Rupert mentioned, which is another output of the um, COPIN project, specifically the project of Work Package 2. And what the Open Book Collective is, um, is currently registering in the process of registering as a UK charity that brings together publishers, publishing service providers and research institutions, particularly university libraries, but other research institutions as well, were committed to working across the open knowledge commons to enable a more sustainable future for OA books. So in a nutshell, this is our offer, a not-for-profit not collective platform where libraries can find, assess, and sign up to a range of quality open access packages from diverse publishers, wherein all members have the opportunity to be involved in its governance. And now I'll explain exactly how that offer works. So the Open Book Collective is founded on some core values, which we've bullet pointed here. These are enshrined in our governance charter and the Board of Stewards task is to uphold and ensure that these values are maintained. I'll discuss the Board of Stewards and the governance structure in a moment. The care and curation of high quality academic books, a commitment to bibliodiversity, collaboration and resource sharing, community building over profit-driven centralization, horizontal working relationships, and safeguarding open accessibility and reuse of academic books for global readers. As you may guess, there's a reason why there's an urgent need for the OBC at this moment. As the landscape moves more towards open access and the publication of open access books um, in, a in accordance with international initiatives, we need to ensure that this is done in an ethical, sustainable and equitable way. At the moment, the landscape of open access book publishing is over reliant on book processing charges. These have some fundamental problems which the OBC is hoping to address by assisting small to medium academic publishers in moving away from dependence on book processing charges. The reasons that we want to do this are that book processing charges sustain inequity so that academics with secure long-term funding at wealthy institutions are more likely to get published. This leads to the entrenchment of established academic hierarchies, a stultification of fields, lack of opportunity and damage to the career tra trajectories of younger, more precarious staff. It also supports the kind of commercial mon monopolies that the Open Book Collective positions itself in opposition to. Right now, there's a danger of the open access landscape being taken over by major, major commercial players. We've already seen several recent acquisitions that will lead to a lack of diversity, meaning that fewer publishers will survive and there's poorer value for everyone in the supply chains. Now, of course, there are other ways of funding OA books, such as institutional support and freemium models, but they're unreliable and make it difficult for publishers to have long-term plans in place. Now, the following video is gonna explain in a couple of minutes how the OBC platform will work. 
I hope you'll hear the sound, but if you don't, it does have subtitles. Okay, well, the sound didn't work, but never mind. If you want to hear it with sound, follow at Open Book Collect on Twitter because I tweeted the video yesterday. Um, so here's the Open Book Collective business model. The publisher or service provider offers a membership program, and I'll show you a little bit more about how libraries can um, either select a pre-selected program to support or create a bespoke one on the website using the wireframes that we have. They pay to support the membership plus an OBC processing fee. And um, the rate that the library pays is tiered on a model similar to JISC banding. It's not the same as JISC banding, but it's the same principle that the size of the institution determines um, the amount that the, the member pays. So then the OBC collects this membership um, program revenue and processing fee. This is all non-for-profit and it has to be non-for-profit because it's a charity. The publisher or service provider receives that, but they can only use that for the creation of open access books um, or possibly open access content. I'm not sure in, entirely if it's just books. Um, then the library receives metadata updates and other benefits. Um, and the residual of that goes into the OBC Development Fund, which in the future, um, initiatives will be able to apply to. Um, for instance, if they need help launching a new initiative, helping publishers improve and so on. And obviously there'll be a committee to decide on the distribution of that. And that is made up of 50% of the fees from publishers and service providers. Um, and then we have the OBC Management Fund, which simply funds the operating costs of the Open Book Collective. Um, and that is made up of all the fees received, all the processing fees received from library and the other 50% of the publisher and service provider fees. And you can see um, on the right hand pane exactly how that breaks down. I'm not going to read it all out. Here, very quickly, uh, let me just check on the time. Yeah, we're all right. Here are some of the wireframes from the website. The reason that it looks sort of strangely vertical is because this is what you'll see as you scroll down the page. So obviously it won't be in that kind of portrait format, but as you scroll down, like this will be the first screen you'll see and then you'll scroll down and see here. So this is gonna be the home page. This is hoping to launch in July, I believe. Um, You'll see the tabs where libraries and readers and authors and publishers can take action, where you can learn more about the different aspects of the platform. And then this is what I was talking about before. As a library member, you can start to build your quotation. So you can either opt for one of our kind of pre-made collectives and collections. So you might choose to support the scholar-led consortium of scholar-led publishers. You might choose to support the London Library Consortium, or you might put your own together by selecting and learning more about the publishers. And this is something that um, librarians have told us is really important, is that ease of comparison and having all of these initiatives in one place so that they compare the local value to their institution 
as well as, for example, the values of the publisher, the future plans of the publisher, because it's very time consuming and it's very labor intensive, intensive for librarians to go and kind of do all this and then find the data that they need to justify an investment to their budget holders. So this really takes a lot of the labor and, and time out of that. So how it, and by the way, the catalog is, is open to everyone. You don't have to become a member to view the catalog, obviously. Um, so how is the open book collective gonna be governed? Well, there's basically three bodies. Everybody who, and I'm gonna kind of approach this in reverse order that is on the slide. Anybody who becomes a member, whether you're a library, whether you're um, a publisher, whether you're a publisher consortium, a service, a service um, provider, has um, an opt-in to become a member of the General Assembly of Custodians, enabling you to have one vote at AGMs and other um, meetings and decisions. Then we have the membership committee. Also being a, a, a member of the General Assembly makes you eligible, I can never say that word, eligible, to either nominate yourself or be nominated by another member to become part of the rest of the governance structure. So then we have the membership committee that is responsible for assessing and processing applications for membership um, and biannually reviewing and revising this. And then we have the board of stewards, which is more to do with stewarding and upholding the values that I spoke about in the beginning making sure that the OBC is living up to its mission, and of course, following the requisite protocols for a charitable organization. Now, the proviso here is that the Board of Stewards and the Membership Committee have a quota to be to provide equal representation or fair representation of the different kinds of members, so that, for instance, publishers and librarians are equally represented. Um, that's all I'm going to say for the moment. I know this session is probably over time at the moment anyway, but if you want to hear more details on any of that or you'd like to connect with us and get involved, the easiest thing is to scan this code right here. That will take you to a sign up for our mailing list um, and you can get all the updates and the new blog posts as they come out. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. I should have written this down, but I'll put it in the chat. It's at, I'll put it in the chat letter, at Open Book Collect. So just like Open Book Collective, except that was too long. And if you follow that, you'll get a link every time we put a new blog post up, because we are blogging now ahead of the launch of the platform. And I've also put um, the contact details for myself, for, I'm actually the primary UK contact, but you also have the, the, the European contact and um, the US contact. So I'll leave that one there and I'll hand back over to Tom now. Stop share. I'm actually not sure if you're handing over to me or if uh, Nancy has resolved the uh, video issue. Still no sound. I hear sound. It's really faint though, Nancy. If you can pump up the volume, I think that might do the trick. Last landscape, um, emerging policy Yay. discussions, and also then speak a bit about one of the models that we're implementing at the COPIN project to try to help university presses to move to OA amenable business models. It's worth starting with a quick recap of why open access and why it matters. COVID-19, I think, exposed something that we've known for quite some time, but that was really accentuated during the pandemic, which is that humanities infrastructures are still very reliant on print in many ways, and they're reliant on long form scholarship. And the problem is that at the moment, we don't have a good digital transition for dealing with this and providing equitable worldwide access to knowledge.
Indeed, we've seen traditional sales of academic books have dropped over the last 30 years, um, but we're still working as though every book is going to sell the same number of copies as, as it did in the past and try and sustain our publishing enterprises using that logic. We know that open access offers increased readership, usage and citation, and we're seeing an increasing number of funder mandates worldwide that are pushing us towards uh, new models for open access uh, monographs. A good example of that is the UK situation where the UKRI review published recently uh, set out uh, that from 2024, the requirement for um, open access will be extended to monographs that are funded by the UKRI policy. Um, now that doesn't apply to the UK's REF, if you know about that, the Research Excellence Framework that covers um, a lot more grounds than the project funding of UKRI. Um, and it's not clear yet what the funding situation would look like if we went that far. What we are seeing though, are a powerful group of funders who are funding high quality project work, who are insisting now that open access um, accompany the work that they fund. And that's likely to change the international landscape, even while it's national level funders, and while we're still talking about um, a specific set of project funded enterprises. And it's on that uh, stage that the COPIM project enters the scene, really. COPIM is a £3.6 million international partnership funded by the Research England Development Fund um, and by Arcadia, which is a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. It's a partnership of libraries, universities, OA book publishers, researchers and infrastructure providers who are coming together to try to plug the gaps in what we do uh, for open access monographs. That includes, as my colleague is going to talk about shortly, uh, metadata um, and intermediaries and, and thinking about the supply chain. Um, it also includes thinking about how we make the landscape of funding models legible to libraries um, and how uni university presses, scholar-led publishers and others can come together to give affordable solutions to the OA monograph um, dilemma. It's also worth saying that the open access book world looks somewhat different to the open access journal world. There are many, many more publishers and directive open access books than in the DOAJ. Um, and what we see is that the OA books market has many smaller players uh, with publications in many languages across a broad spectrum of subject areas. So you've got a much longer tail to sustain here. And this means that the dangers of consolidation, if we're not careful, can be even greater than in the journal world. So we know in the journal world that we've seen the emergence of a few very strong central players who control most of the market. Um, it would be a shame to lose the bibliodiversity that we have in the directory of open access books at the moment um, if we thought that only a few players were going to gobble up all the resources. And that's why um, as part of the work that I'm doing at COPIM, we've been trying to think about business models and trying to think about what new business models can sustain open access book publishing. But we're not the only ones and we need to acknowledge um, the previous work that's been done and the emerging model landscape. So really there are three strata um, in the last year that we've seen really come to prominence in a way and that I want to, to pay some tributes to. Um, and the first is to point out the the background work of scholar-led presses. So academic-led presses have been at the vanguard of implementing uh, radical new models for open access that don't have book processing charges. And that's a really important thing that we avoid book processing charges because most humanities researchers do not have recourse to it. That's why the sales model in some ways for books is quite good. It manages to spread costs among many, many libraries who each buy a single copy, but that means that centrally the publisher has enough money to conduct their business. When we move to a book processing charge model, we instead concentrate those entire costs on one part of the system, and it's often unaffordable for the researcher in question. So models that avoid book processing charges are, in my view, the most important economic thing that we need to see emerging. And scholar-led presses like Open Book Publishers and Punctum Books have run successful membership schemes that helped sustain their enterprises um, and have really piloted the way. 
Um, I should also say in the journal world, my Open Library of Humanities has also pioneered that type of model where libraries all pay a membership fee to sustain the organisation so that we can conduct our publishing activities, but be open access without author facing charges. Now, from those successes have sprung a series of uh, new models. And one of those is, say, MIT Press's Direct Open Scheme, which is a frontlist subscription threshold system, where if enough people subscribe to the frontlist any given year, the frontlist is made open access. That's a way of basically saying, if we reach our revenue target, we'll make works openly accessible. Cambridge University Press has a similar thing working at the book level, where if a book meets a revenue target, they make that specific book open access, which is really good in some ways. You know, it's, it's a move towards open access, but it's also um, a system in which only the popular books are the ones that are, are made openly accessible. And by popular, I mean the ones that are bought, not necessarily the ones that have the greatest academic impact. In the middle, there's a series of small to medium sized university presses, academic presses who want low risk, no threshold models for achieving open access that don't rely on book processing charges. And really, that's where the model um, that we've implemented at COPIM called Opening the Future comes into play. Opening the Future is a library subscription model where libraries subscribe to backlist of packages of non-open access books that are offered by the publisher. So those books are not open access. There's packages of up to 50 books and you subscribe to them just for your own library. So that's really looking like a very conventional sales system. Um, you can even pay for it out of an acquisitions budget and we hope that people will. What's good about the model, though, is that the publisher is using the revenue from those backlist subscriptions to make front list books openly accessible. In this way, what we do is we offer something to libraries to buy that they can then uh, use to fund open access for the front list every year. And in this way, we incrementally grow the front list of books becoming openly accessible. We're piloting this model with Liverpool University Press, who are working at the series level, and Central European University Press, who are working to convert their entire front list of research monographs every year, or approximately 25 books or so, to an open access basis without book processing charges. And we've, we've designed this model to try to give a range of member benefits. So the first thing to note is that we've priced this as appealingly as possible. The most expensive of our bandings for the biggest libraries is half the cost of a single article processing charge at a commercial um, for-profit journal publisher. So 50 books locally and potentially 25 new books from these presses for half an article processing charge. You know, they say there isn't much money in the humanities, but really we've tried to account for that deficit and to make this an appealing model. That gives unlimited DRM free access to the packages of titles. There's no um, limits on concurrency, for example, it's just a PDF that the researcher can use. Um, after three years, it's perpetual access as well. The metadata is provided in standard MARC KBART formats and there's counter compliance statistics. And if we can get to the levels of participation that we're looking for, we're looking at just $12 per book per library which is a heck of a lot cheaper than we're seeing in the sales model as it stands. The other point here is that as members grow, costs can go down. Because costs are spread between different institutions, if we hit the revenue targets, we can actually charge less in future years or publish more books. But essentially, there's better value for money for libraries the more who participate. And what's important about this model is that we've aimed to make it melioristic. It gets better step by step rather than saying we have to do all or nothing. The problem with something like um, Knowledge Unlatched, in my view, for example, was the threshold, where if you don't meet the threshold, none of the books make it through and you just hit this impasse. What we're saying is as libraries subscribe and we hit the next level and we've got enough funding for a book, the next book will be made openly accessible at that point. And in that way, we can gradually unlock the front list over time, working year on year to get to that point, rather than simply saying it's an all or nothing deal. It's worth saying that Opening the Future is not a read and publish deal, though. What we're trying to get away from is the coupling of 
a university pays a fee so its researchers can publish openly. What we're saying is sustain presses that we value and that work within the fields that we want to see succeed. Work with them to implement non-book processing charge models and then anybody who comes to the press will be able to publish without a book processing charge. And that's a much better situation for scholarship in general, for academic freedom. It gets around all the researcher concerns about bypassing peer review and so on, um, and really gets us into a much better position. This model is good for publishers, though, because in addition to avoiding book processing charges, it's relatively low risk. You don't have to make a book open access until you've got the funding. And also, we've laid the groundwork. We're going to publish a toolkit shortly that shows publishers what you need to do to implement this kind of model at your own press. And that's how I'm going to close up. Um, libraries, you can support this model at openingthefuture.net. Um, there's a full list of um, titles there, FAQs, brochures, um, everything about what we're doing. But I just want to close with it with a last plea in sort of 20 seconds, which is as, as follows. We've been told that this is a time when we need to experiment if we're going to see open access monographs come to fruition. The problem is some libraries are seeing that as, well, you set up an experiment and we'll watch and see what happens. If libraries don't participate in these experiments, they will fail by definition. So now is the time, really, if you're a library that wants to see open access, support models like this so that other publishers can feel that they have confidence that this model can work for them too. And then we'll be on the pathway towards a much brighter future for OA monographs. Thank you very much.